And again, I'd like to welcome you to our AWS webcast today. I'm going to hand it over to our first presenter, Colin White. Colin. Thank you, Aurora. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this AWS webinar. Today, we'll, we'll learn about implementing Microsoft Windows Server and SQL Server for high availability on Amazon Web Services. The content is derived from a white paper published in March of this year written by AWS Solutions Architect Ulf Shu and Senior Product Manager David Pei. The paper walks through all of the implement, implementation steps in detail, showing you how to create an example solution. The presentation will give an overview of that process, highlighting key concepts and considerations, as well as, well as point to ways that you can customize the solution to fit the needs of your particular scenario. Delivering today's presentation is AWS Solutions Architect Miles Ward, a three-time technology startup entrepreneur with a decades, decade of experience building global scale analysis infrastructures. Miles has been at Amazon Web Services since 2010 and is responsible for designing and developing AWS solution architectures relating to big data and social analytics, multi-tiered storage, cost optimization, and approaches for high availability and disaster recovery with relational database management systems. Thanks for joining us today, Miles. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited. This is a topic that's been quite a while in the making. I started with uh, AWS, like Colin said, in 2010. Uh, and even as far back as that, we heard from customers that high availability for Windows workloads was a critical component of their designs for running mission-critical systems in the cloud. And we, we worked together closely with our partners at Microsoft uh, to work through the technical issues and to build not only what we believe is a, a working and, and successfully deployable uh, uh, Windows Server failover cluster on EC2, uh, but we've also made that uh, one of the easiest places to do that kind of deployment. So I'm excited to bring this material to you. Um, today's webinar will serve as a, a good overview of the structures and practices. Uh, we'll review not only the, the design of the system, but uh, take a quick look at the CloudFormation templates that we've built uh, to make this all easier to get built. And, uh, and easier to get started with. Before I get too far into this, I, I certainly want to remind everyone this is a relatively advanced topic. We're going to cover features of AWS services like Amazon EC2, Virtual Private Cloud, as well as nuanced features of the Windows Server 2008 R2 platform, including AD, um, you know, Windows DNS, and the full feature set of the Windows Server failover clustering modules. Uh, and then down into SQL Server to show an example of an always-on availability group. So those, that's not what you do on your first day with EC2. So certainly recommend, um, you know, if you're interested in learning more details for that, you know, take, hang out with us and, 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 and listen in on this content. But we have a lot more material that covers those kind of early products and other uses. So as an introduction, as a as a goal statement for what we're trying to do together today, we're going to review uh, what Microsoft and Amazon together have presented as really the best practice for building production systems on AWS using Windows servers. The, the design here is, follows the, I think, the sort of standard best practices that are available on any technology platform. If you don't want something to break, you probably shouldn't have a single point of failure. So this design using Microsoft technologies uh, uh, makes it so that that kind of single point of failure in your Windows server infrastructure can be eliminated. So the, the Microsoft approach for that is the Windows server failover clustering uh, and then down into the individual applications like SQL Server for always on. Um, this presentation will make, uh, we hope, that process a little more clear. So how does Microsoft work on top of AWS at all? Um, there, there are not only the sort of technical structures that are required to ensure that you can start a Windows server and that you can start a virtual private cloud and these other pieces. We also want to remind our listeners uh, about the licensing requirements that are a part of that. Amazon's done a lot to make licensing on AWS easy, uh, probably easier than it is most other places, because we allow you to rent the Windows Server and SQL Server standard or web edition licenses by the hour. 
So you're able to use EC2 instances just for the periods of time that you need them and pay only a low hourly fee for the software that's embedded in those instances. No need to buy separate CALs or, or establish different kind of licensing structures. Um, for software applications that sit above the Windows Server tier, applications like uh, SQL Server Enterprise or Link or SharePoint, those applications are licensed by Microsoft uh, through their software assurance program to tolerate a, a business practice called uh, license mobility. So there's a lot of detail on the Amazon Web Services website uh, that describes the process for license mobility. It's basically a form you fill out, and that allows you to migrate licenses for Microsoft products onto AWS facilities. So in the examples that we're describing today to do this kind of always-on failover clustering for SQL Server, uh, you'll, you'll likely want to, you know, for, for folks running on SQL Server Enterprise, you'd be migrating those licenses to AWS. Um, we've worked together closely with Microsoft to make sure that that process is as pain-free as possible, and, and we have a lot of folks successfully running that kind of thing today. So once you've, once you've got straightened out the licensing requirements, which we've done a lot to make easier, um, then you move forward to, okay, how do I build a production system? How do we make this something that uh, provides all of the benefits of fault tolerance that WSFC uh, enables? So we're going to go through three steps. Uh, first, we're going to configure on Amazon Web Services our network infrastructure. At AWS, we've built this service called Virtual Private Cloud that allows you to establish purpose-built static networking at individual subnets that allow you to define a network structure that has sufficient resources to support the Windows Server failover clustering model. Following the deployment and management and setup of the network and Active Directory infrastructure, then we'll walk through the process of actually launching the Windows Server failover cluster nodes, the working application servers uh, that will manage uh, manage and, and operate in a clustered mode. And then on top of that working Windows Server failover cluster uh, of instances, we'll do a, a subsequent step by installing SQL Server 2012 and enabling an always-on availability group above that cluster. So that should take you end-to-end -end from starting in an AWS account that has nothing set up and is, is completely bereft of resources to, uh, to a high-performance production environment uh, that's ready to tolerate uh, unexpected failures of individual components. Really a powerful best practices design. So let's dig sort of one tier further down. There are a set of basic network resources that are required in order for this server failover cluster to function correctly. So you need a virtual private cloud. That's Amazon's label for a static networking environment where you're able to define the network address ranges that your servers use. Then inside of that uh, virtual private cloud, you'll be building subnets. So subnets are uh, contiguous IP address ranges in a range space which you define. Uh, they don't overlap, so you can't have uh, two ranges that are the same, but you do have your own private space, so you could have the same range as some other customer. It doesn't matter that it's a private space just for you. So you'll also be establishing a routing table that allows you to move traffic uh, into the individual instances. Uh, and we'll be building uh, uh, an instance of a specific type. An instance is an Amazon word for a server. We'll be building a NAT instance that allows you to do network traffic to the private subnets for management from the public subnet, right? So a public subnet is connected to the Internet using elastic IP addresses to the individual instances running inside of it. Private subnets do not natively route to the Internet. So we'll be creating a bastion host or a remote desktop gateway instance that runs in the public subnet that allows us to reach in and securely administrate 
the Windows Server failover cluster instances in our private subnet. We'll also create Elastic IP resources. So Elastic IP addresses allow us to uh, connect the NAT instance and our remote desktop gateway to, the, uh, to uh, permit internet traffic. And we'll also create instances to host our Active Directory and the Windows Server failover cluster nodes. Inside of a VPC, there are a couple of other network structures as well that will be important. So one is a, a network ACL, which you can kind of think of as a security group for the subnet. So we'll configure that to make sure that we've got the right traffic permitted for ingress and egress. We'll also configure the security group, which is a firewall for sets of instances. So you can have multiple security groups inside of a single network ACL inside of a subnet. So we'll go through the construction of that. And I think what will be really clear as we move through this is that it's very, very valuable that we've built and codified a bunch of this, uh, frankly, heavy lifting uh, into CloudFormation scripts so that it's not something you have to figure out from scratch. So what we'll end up with uh, looks like this, this nested oniony layer of infrastructure uh, first on the outside a virtual private cloud that sits inside of an Amazon Web Services region. So the regions are the geographical uh, uh, clusters of availability zones. So we'll build a VPC inside of one of our regions. Inside of that, we'll build in a, a pair of availability zones. Those are the sets of infrastructure where you can build things like instances. Inside of those availability zones, we'll build several subnets inside of those subnets. They'll be protected and controlled by network ACLs. Inside of those network ACLs will be instances which are protected and controlled by security groups. Inside of a specific one of these subnets, we'll be building EC2 instances which will use Windows Server failover clustering to tolerate uh, uh, that kind of failover behavior. Uh, so that's, that chart is a little easier to see if you see it in the direct white paper, uh, it's a little bit of an eye chart because there are a lot of components there, but the end result is something that's very secure and very much follows both Microsoft and Amazon best practices. So let's, let's dive in. Let's, let's look through the configuration of our virtual network, this network stack above uh, and abstracted above the AWS infrastructure and the Active Directory infrastructure. So. Um, we, we need all of these pieces not because they're just sort of extra buttons that it's fun to push. Um, we need them because they provide the controls and the resources necessary to ensure that the failover cluster behaves uh, in the way that you want. There are lots of designs for this where you could probably create a cluster and get it to turn on, but not have it actually fail over. And so we really want to make sure that the design that we've built does all of the things uh, that together Microsoft and Amazon want to make sure uh, it is built the way it's built. So uh, we've built a pair of CloudFormation templates to help you deploy this system because it is uh, a, a very large number of building blocks. Let's talk through uh, the first of those templates. So uh, it is scripted uh, and the scripting of that is manipulable. So the way a CloudFormation template works, uh, CloudFormation is a product from Amazon Web Services, it creates a, a template in the form of a JSON file that allows you to, uh, us, it actually allows Amazon, to run through a pre-scripted set of steps. And it treats those steps as an atomic command, a single command. So if any part of your launch of this stack has a problem, let's say, for example, you, you, know, you type in the name of your key pair incorrectly. That's the first variable in this stack. You thought your key pair was called I am awesome and it's actually called I am really awesome. And, and so the stack depends on having that key pair being correctly named. And so CloudFormation will roll all of that back so you don't have to clean up any sort of detritus, leftover stuff from a failed launch. So inside of this CloudFormation template, will actually let you to will tolerate 23 distinct parameters which you can adjust to make sure that the cluster that we build is the right size. Um, you know, there are some users that will want 
the default, which is our Active Directory server instances running on M1 extra larges. Those are great servers. If you're going to build a huge cluster, you may want to go with larger instances. If you're going to build a tiny, tiny test cluster, maybe you can build on M1 larges. It also allows you to configure the NAT instance type. So if the amount of traffic moving back and forth from the control tier to the back-end databases is really big, you may want to increase the NAT instance type. Most of the time, that can be quite small since the control messages are usually no more than one remote desktop session. You, you can also configure the domain's DNS name, the NetBIOS name, uh, all sorts of structures including the domain administrator user. This is actually building Active Directory on its own on your behalf. You don't have to do any of that setup. Um, but probably the most important configuration is the series of CIDR ranges. Those are sets of network addresses that the public and private subnets will use. So for example, you're going to want each of those subnets to have a different set of addresses, and then you'll want to enumerate that some of those subnets are in one of the availability zones, while the other subnets are in a different availability zone. So that mapping of do you want to use 10 dot addresses, do you want to use 192 addresses, you know, are you, are you trying to map up to your current corporate data center's address ranges and have additional uh, sequential addresses there? So important that you uh, evaluate the current setup uh, and ensure that not only do you have private and public subnet address ranges that match up with your needs, but also that your VPC, the virtual private cloud that you built, its address range is designed to contain all of those smaller address ranges. So typically, we use a slash 16 for a VPC and slash 24s for, uh, for the CIDR blocks for public and private subnets. That template takes about an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes to run start to finish. There are a very large number of steps in there. I actually, it's 1,600 lines of CloudFormation JSON. That is non-trivial. So, uh, you know, you can, you can thank Ulf every time you start one of these clusters that you don't have to go write all of that code. Um, but it will save a lot more than that hour and 20 minutes of time when it goes through and runs through the hundreds of uh, automation steps. So when you run that first part of the system, what that does is uh, finishes the construction of what I'd call the outer shell and all the support constructs that need to be in place to allow you to build the actual Windows Server failover cluster, right? I mean, that cluster doesn't function without Active Directory, and Active Directory doesn't function without the servers that Active Directory stands on top of. So you need all of those building blocks in place so that the second template can inherit a bunch of the names and addresses and use those variables in, uh, in deploying the rest of the cluster. So uh, let's do that part. Uh, the next step is launching those Windows Server failover cluster nodes, the instances on AWS. So each of these uh, clustered instances will run, uh, in this example, Windows Server 2008 R2, uh, and it will launch those instances into individual subnets. And it's really important, the failover cluster model only functions when distributed across distinct subnets. And following the Amazon Web Services structural best practices, it's really important for those kinds of failover models to span availability zones, to go across two different availability zones. What that means is that, you know, let's say, for example, you know, out of all of the things that can go wrong, probably the, the most likely of them would be that an individual EC2 instance would fail. So if that instance fails, that would trigger Windows Server failover clustering, and that would move you just to a different instance. If, if instead a more rare failure were to happen, say, for example, an entire availability zone, that's like a cluster of data centers falling off the Internet. Because you're deployed in multiple availability zones, you, you get all of the same benefits of failover, but even if you know, dozens or hundreds of your instances that are in the other availability zone uh, are to be lost. So very, very powerful boon to your high availability that very much follows the best practices. So the second template, this scripted deployment, 
uh, deploys those Windows Server failover cluster nodes, uh, renames all of them to a useful net BIOS name, joins all of those instances to the domain, creates a SQL service account, SQL SA, to the local administrator group, uh, inside of the Windows Server installs the Windows Server failover clustering feature, so you actually have the, the services available to create that cluster, downloads SQL Server as an evaluation, installs it, and opens uh, all of the appropriate uh, TCP ports to ensure the cluster can be constructed. So in the same way as the first template uh, has a, a series of variables that you can modify to ensure that this thing uh, is designed the way that you need, the second template has the same. It has 20 different defined parameters. Uh, probably very important uh, one to note would be, you know, what are the instance types of the Windows Server failover cluster nodes? I mean, if you're going to use, you know, uh, M24XLs for, you know, for big databases, you can also take a look at, you know, uh, uh, several other instance types. We have lots of customers that are happy with the new M3 class. Um, uh, you may also want to adjust your NetBIOS names to match up with corporate naming standards um, and, and ensure that you use the same domain DNS name and domain NetBIOS names as you used in the first stack. Uh, that ensures that, you know, you don't build stack number two in a way that it can't really talk to stack number one. So template two, once configured and launched, uh, typically takes about 50 minutes to complete all of its tasks. So uh, so that, that process gets you to a place now where you're, you're, you've gone through quite a bit of the deployment of this cluster. So now is the spot where you step down into the individual EC2 instances to really create the cluster itself. And so that's configurations at the Windows tier. This is stuff that you need to do inside of Windows, not, uh, not out at the AWS control panel. So, um, First, before you can get all the way to that, you do need to uh, create private IP addresses for both nodes of the cluster, for each side of the failover cluster. Those addresses, of course, will be inside of the CIDR range that you set up uh, to ensure that they're, they're in the right subnet. Uh, and then following the creation of those addresses, the attachment of those addresses to the instances, um, you'll, you'll run a process on the Windows side that tests and validates the configuration. That's an automatic process. Um, you'll, you'll also be um, uh, making sure that you, know, you can uh, validate that cluster. To do that, you have to remote desktop into the instance. So what this, what this set of templates is constructed is a pathway for you to log into that first remote desktop gateway instance, which will then remote desktop further into the specific Windows Server failover cluster instances. So there's instructions for that available in the white paper. So in, in the individual node, you'll actually open the server manager, navigate over to the failover cluster manager, and, and you'll run what's called a validate the configuration wizard. So that wizard will walk you through confirming that the CloudFormation template that we built actually built all the parts that it was supposed to build, uh, and, uh, and can complete a series of tests to ensure that the system's prepared to operate as a failover cluster. We've run this thing now quite a few times, and, and suffice to say the CloudFormation script does in fact get you to a place where you have a valid CloudFormation or a valid cluster. So once you've completed validation, then you can run the create cluster wizard, uh, which moves you through the process of actually building the cluster you give the cluster its own name. Uh, you also uh, finish that wizard, and the result of that will be that you are able to, uh, the system will, is now prepared to take new addresses in the server manager uh, to, uh, to use as the sort of failover cluster set. So um, inside, of, uh, inside of the configuration, you're going to set new static IP addresses uh, because you don't want these systems to use DHCP. You're going to use the static IP addresses uh, that you constructed, uh, the first of the two private IP addresses, um, you know, again, from, from the temple. So uh, once you've selected those IP addresses, you can bring the cluster online. It's the, the label is bring this resource online. 
Uh, and once that's done, it'll show in the server manager the name of the cluster, and that's and that that's a running cluster. You now have um, you know the sort of right componentry. So now you've built at this point uh, you know the instances, the servers, and you've enabled them for clustering. So if if you were to say, for example, run a you know a simple IIS site or something like that. Um, you could watch the cl cluster fail over. You can test that by failing one of the instances and watching in the server manager on the other instance what the, uh, what the failover looks like. I can tell you that happens really, really quickly. It's pretty impressive. So what we hear from most customers is not that they intend to run their website this way. It's that they intend to run their database this way. The structures here are, are built and have the the right kinds of features to ensure that your database, not just your you know sort of simpler kinds of things to make highly available, but your real SQL Server database can be run in high availability. So the third part of this system is to install SQL Server 2012 and to enable an always-on availability group. So the first part of that um, includes downloading that group. So uh, the way we'll do this, and the, and the typical pattern is to download the trial version of this software. That includes all of the production bits. It just isn't keyed. Once you've downloaded that trial, you'll need to complete the license mobility component of the Microsoft uh, Software Assurance Program and then bring your actual production keys to license this instance for any kind of real production use. But you can complete the process of installation on that trial version to ensure that everything works the way that we say that it does. and uh, and that you can test failover to ensure that that works the way we say it does. So uh, four basic steps. We're going to set up SQL Server in general, just install the software, uh, then enable the always-on mode, uh, and probably makes most sense to create a test database or exact, a, attach an existing database, maybe something from a backup or uh, another program that you have running on SQL Server, and then create this availability group, uh, actually, uh, drive the table into replication across the availability uh, system. So uh, first step for that is, is setting up SQL Server. So uh, typically you're going to create a service account on the domain controller. You don't want to install SQL Server as a you know local user or something like that. Um, uh, you'll force that domain uh, account, that service account to uh, you know update its own password. You know drive. Uh, drive that new password construction. And then you'll also want to create and share what's called a replica folder, right? So that's the, uh, the storage location for the replication information. And there's uh, a set of uh, wizards that support this stuff. So uh, SQL Server then gets installed on each of the individual instances, and that's what has the wizard. So it'll ask you for the product key, It'll ask you to accept the license terms. It'll ask you to download and then install all the setup files. Um, there's a series of features that you can install. This is full normal SQL Server, so you can install different database engine services and full text indexing and all of the rich features that SQL Server is so valuable because of. Uh, and then once that system is installed and the wizard completes, uh, it'll give you a success message. And you'll need to do that installation not just once, but on each of the different Windows Server failover cluster nodes. So in the template, this is two instances, so you only have to do it twice. But, um, but if you're building a bigger cluster or if down the road you modify this template, you may have to install it more than one time. Um, the step after installation, once the system now has SQL Server on it, you can, uh, you know, uh, Following that, the, the next bit is to enable the high availability modes. So uh, that's called always on. That's a feature for, uh, for SQL Server. First, you'll connect uh, using the remote desktop gateway uh, to remote desktop uh, on the individual Windows Server failover cluster nodes. Uh, use your domain administrator account to bring up the properties on the SQL Service and inside of there, there's actually a separate tab for always on, uh, and you'll just, it's literally a single checkbox. How great is that? Just one little checkbox. After all this work, it comes down to checking this button that says, we should enable always on. So 
Once you've turned that on, uh, it will force you to restart the SQL Server service, so certainly not something that you want to turn on uh, you know, a couple of weeks after production has started being used. Um, definitely kind of a pre-setup step. But uh, once you've restarted SQL Server uh, and the SQL Server service, uh, you'll then uh, be able to create test databases, and following that, um, there's a very important setting inside of the options on the individual databases. Uh, you have to enable a thing called the recovery model to say full. So even though the SQL Server service is set to an always-on mode, there's actually configuration at the individual database, the individual running database system inside of that service that has to be enabled for full recovery. Uh, inside of the SQL Server Management Studio, then, in the Object Explorer, you'd also want to enable not just full recovery, but always on high availability. So full recovery ensures that you can recover in the case of a disaster from kind of more of a, a, a backup. Highly available means that if there's a failure, you're able to come back online um, without, without downtime. Uh, so the, when you create a new availability group, there's actually another wizard. Um, that wizard um, asks you to specify a new name, a named SQL Server availability group, and pick which databases. So even though you started this on, uh, as a reference from a single database, if you have hundreds of different databases running in the SQL Server, you can enable all of that. You'll specify which other instances will operate as additional cluster nodes. They get called uh, replicas or, uh, or secondaries. And you'll see those listed uh, because Active Directory is serving them down to the SQL Server instance. It should be the other instance, uh, usually WSFC node 2 is what the default name is in our CloudFormation script. And from there, you can uh, you enable that and create what's called an availability group listener. And that listener DNS name is, is again, the same uh, static IP address uh, as the, uh, as the uh, Windows Server Failover Cluster node 2. Um, you also want to make sure that you select full synchronization um, and, and hit next. And then it will go through a validation process to ensure that the settings that you've picked are accurate. And you hit finish, and, and it will give you a summary that, yep, it looks like everything's working. Um, following that, you know, in order to test, in order to make sure everything is working right, um, we recommend running a quick PowerShell uh, session as an administrator, and, and you'll want to change the availability group listener host record TTL to 300. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're changing this value that makes it so that um, rather than, you know, 1,200, uh, seconds or, or sorry, milliseconds, but, you know, between objects, 300 is a better setting there, ensures that the failover happens more rapidly, um, uh, much better setting there. Um, you'll also uh, log in on the server manager on the domain controller and double check that DNS is appropriately configured. That means that you'll need all of the availability group listeners' IP addresses uh, available, so there's no no problem. The Active Directory should be able to talk to every one of the instances that's constructed. So uh, that that checkbox is is there, and the the result of this set of steps um, after you've gone through and enabled the recovery model to be full and run a complete backup. So now both sides have synchronized the data that you probably just loaded to that first node only. You, the net result now is really the full list of systems. You now have exactly that chart that we showed at the beginning where the entire environment uh, is available as this you know, nested stack of infrastructure that supports all of the good Windows Server failover cluster models. And now, an important thing, we've, we showed three steps today. We went through the process of building the network infrastructure required to deploy a Windows Server failover cluster. Then we built the Windows servers themselves and then installed a specific application, in this case, SQL Server, to construct that failover cluster. Now, an important thing to recognize is that the Windows Server failover cluster model functions across 
myriad Microsoft products. So you can use this same model to create highly available SharePoint systems or to create highly available exchange systems. So certainly it's worth looking at the individual Microsoft applications that you're looking to run on AWS and potentially evaluating different either modifications to our existing CloudFormation scripts or getting most of the way through this set of steps, probably steps one and two, and then changing step three to better map to your actual workload. So we've, we've gone through, I think, a pretty bulky set of material. There's a lot of detail here. Um, you know, suffice to say that the template designs and the, uh, the sort of variable-driven deployment of this infrastructure certainly makes it significantly easier to get a Windows Server failover cluster up and running. This is something you can do before lunch. Uh, it's, it's not the kind of thing that, uh, that we're finding even new users to AWS uh, as having too much difficulty because it automates and systematizes so many of the Amazon-centric components of this design. So that, that makes it easier. We've also uh, shown through, uh, through the testing of the failover cluster system that, that this really does provide the kind of best practices, high availability design that, uh, that we find most of our customers demand for these kinds of production workloads. So that means a single instance can fail, the storage subsystem for an instance could fail, the network connectivity on an instance could fail. You can have a failover of a whole availability zone you can have you know, all sorts of different kinds of problems, and this cluster will stay online and stay delivering, uh, you know, delivering high performance database uh, or other Windows application uh, services to your users. We really recommend, um, you know, this isn't the time just because Amazon's gone through and done this work in testing. Um, doesn't mean that you don't need to test as well. Um, you know, everybody's implementations are a little bit different your network stack and your specific tables for your databases and, and the data storage that needs that you have, all of that different stuff should certainly be put through the test um, before you're ready to deploy. But we've also captured that testing process, uh, the steps for validating that a cluster is really providing the kinds of high availability that you want uh, uh, inside of the white paper. So certainly recommend uh, that everybody take a look at those steps. This lets you get to, um, you know, what we think is the right model, you know, following Netflix and the other, you know, cloud-centric builders, this kind of chaos monkey style where any given part of the infrastructure can fail, but the service that you're delivering to your customers, to your stakeholders, it stays online and stays highly available. So today's presentation, again, is is a summary, is an overview of, of a white paper that's available online. Um, there's not only documentation from Amazon about this solution and this scenario, uh, but there's also quite a bit of information available from Microsoft as well. So I uh, really encourage that everybody uh, listening in take a look at the white paper. It has these steps listed out one at a time so, and, and it has very clear visuals to show the different screens that are a part of walking through enabling this system. There's also quite a lot of information from Microsoft about, uh, about how uh, failover clusters add value to systems and the different kinds of features that are available. We've also shown a lot of detail for developers that are building applications that depend on WSFC um, using our you know, .NET developer or you know, uh, some other examples that are available in PowerShell as well. Um, we've also launched pretty recently uh, a lot of detail about the SharePoint workload on Amazon Web Services. Uh, we've even released a new set of video tutorials there. So recommend everybody who's looking at Windows Server failover clustering for SharePoint workloads take a look at those. Um, we, we've built a pretty significant practice and have a lot of expertise today around high-scale, high-performance, high-availability um, Microsoft Server and Windows Server products uh, workloads on top of AWS. Happy to hear your questions or field your feedback uh, either directly on the sort of Microsoft general alias, there's a contact us list uh, there on screen, 
uh, as well as even more specifically on SharePoint um, at the links below. Um, that concludes the, the recorded webinar component of the Windows SQL Server for high availability on AWS. Um, really appreciate everybody's participation and, and hope that this is something that enables you to uh, build great services going forward. We've got a lot of questions, and so I'm excited to dig in um, with folks and get into some answers on those. So we're going to take a second to do a little triage, but we'll get right into it. Yes, thank you. Great job, Miles. Um, and just sifting through some of the questions here and looking for some of the more common ones. <clears throat> um, I think we'll start with, so we saw how this um, scenario can be set up on two availability zones in a single region. Um, and I'm getting to see some questions about can we do three AZs? Can we do multi-regions? Uh, is there a limit to the number of servers on a cluster? Can you speak to some of the ways this can be uh, scoped out? Sure. So the, the CloudFormation template creates a, a best practices structure that allows, uh, we think, the deployment that we've heard from most customers that they want to see run, more than one availability zone inside of a single region. If you're going to look at a deployment that spans more availability zones, I think that works great. And there isn't anything in the structure of, of Windows Server failover clustering that won't tolerate three availability zones or going across regions. But there is, there is additional work. And the CloudFormation template today doesn't capture those structures. So it would be the sort of thing where you would need to do some, um, some infrastructure development research on your own. Uh, to look at the design changes either to our CloudFormation templates or to a more manual deployment to, uh, to span those additional resources. Additionally, if you're going to look at this kind of replication for high availability at the cross-regional tier, Amazon's made that significantly cheaper pretty recently. We reduced the prices associated with region-to-region -region network transit. But from a performance standpoint, you may certainly want to take a look at uh, WAN optimization technologies or other kinds of systems to ensure that your remote replicas stay in sync. Great. Thank you very much. Um, now for an easier question. If we do want to do um, maybe a, a wider scale solution like this and we want to customize the um, CloudFormation templates, is that just with a text editor or do we have, is there some interface to edit those? Sure. The the, the way CloudFormation was designed um, today, the CloudFormation template language is written in JSON. So uh, there isn't a specific editor uh, or anything that, that works better. Certainly JSON uh, accepts basic markup in a bunch of different normal uh, IDEs and text editors, um, but there isn't an Amazon native um, uh, template manipulation tool. We do have a system uh, that I encourage everybody to take a look at called CloudFormer, which is itself a CloudFormation template that creates an instance which can read your AWS infrastructure deployment as it currently exists and convert that into a CloudFormation template, which can be a great tool for uh, getting some example snippets or for getting close to uh, a copy of your current infrastructure Another tool that's very useful there, there are numerous CloudFormation template examples that capture the kinds of syntax required to, uh, you know, to do some of the more advanced structures like multiple elastic network interfaces and other pieces there. Great. Um, what about performance? Is there, is there a performance impact to running always on on the SQL instance? And sure, absolutely. Like any replication technology, um, you know, in particular, Microsoft's done a lot, I think, in comparison to most, to doing what they can to reduce the impact, uh, performance impact between running unreplicated and running replicated. Uh, the, the typical impact there have to do with if the secondary gets slow, the master slows down too. And, and that replication system, while in, in this model is designed because of, uh, because of the setup to ensure that there isn't data loss, uh, the optimization going that direction, ensuring that you retain consistent data and that there isn't data loss, does mean that there's a performance overhead associated. Um, we've found for most customers that that overhead uh, is something that they can tolerate and that the, 
um, that the value of high availability pretty pretty significantly outweighs it. Okay. And how about uh, SQL 2008? They have always on availability groups in that version as well, correct? That's correct. There there are structures available in SQL Server 2012 that that have made this something we've been able to bring to market earlier. It's not to say that it's impossible on 2008, but we don't have a template that describes that. And we heard from most customers that they were most interested in doing this on 2012. Uh, as we do additional research, we'll dig in to figure out whether that's something we can uh, we can teach the market as well. Cool. Do you have a sense for how long this process takes if somebody were to sit down and they knew it pretty well end to end? Sure. We, we, uh, we're we actually considering doing races. Um, uh, I think, you know, we've seen guys that have been able to tear through the thing in about three hours. That means you've done it once or twice, and trust me, Ulf has done it once or a dozen twices. Um, so there's certainly uh, familiarity helps. Um, but I think the white paper lays out the steps clearly enough that even if this is something that you've never done, and as long as you're kind of going along with the defaults that we specify, if this takes you more than, you know, the easy part of a day, it's probably, you, you probably should try a different way. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've seen some questions about people asking, why not RDS? Would you be able to apply RDS in kind of a similar um, type of failover scenario? What are some of the advantages of, of running Windows on EC2 versus just using the database as a service? Sure, it's a great question. So, so if you look at the template setup that this structure deploys, if you look at all the different pieces, it's not just a database server. There's NAT instances and remote desktop gateway instances and active directory instances and this other supporting cast of servers and features that are required to deliver this always-on experience. And if you look at RDS, it's really designed to build the database part. And so uh, there's a lot of complexity associated with building this kind of replication without, you know, without any of that other kind of supporting infrastructure. That's really not the Microsoft best practices way to do it. So RDS allows you to get to very consistently high performance, very, uh, very easy to deploy, uh, you know, frankly, much, much, much faster than this litany of steps that we've outlined. Um, the flip side of that is that it does not offer always on high availability and does not offer, um, you know, direct uh, SQL Server OS level access to the instance. So there's a trade-off there between, you know, maybe more web-oriented workloads or reporting-oriented workloads where, um, where those kinds of extra features don't add a lot of value or um, versus the kinds of things that an always on cluster is the right fit for. Great. Um, how would a uh, hybrid cluster fit into this, or is there a way to do this in kind of a hybrid way? Sure. So, um, you know, if your network environment is designed to operate in the same way as our network environment, and you're able to use the VPN hardware devices from AWS to establish a dedicated connection from Amazon into an external facility, there's no reason that you couldn't establish this kind of replication uh, across that gap. Now, there may be some uh, structural stuff that you need to do around uh, the automation of manipulation of IP addresses on our side. Um, it's certainly a very different set of tools making these changes inside of AWS than it is maybe with, you know, running around with a keyboard and mouse inside your data center doing this stuff. So, um, you know, certainly the kind of thing where you're going to want to test it and you're going to want to probably assign a higher amount of time associated with getting it stood up and running, but there aren't any technical blockers that make it so that's not something you can do. Great. And what about price? Um, can you speak to how, how much would this kind of default setup cost somebody to run? Sure. It's, that's actually one of the coolest parts of the CloudFormation system. Every CloudFormation template, uh, based on the infrastructure components that it enumerates, Right in the wizard inside CloudFormation, when you run the wizard, it, there's a little tiny link, and it's easy to miss, but it says cost in a little blue underline. That navigates you to the Amazon Web Services simple monthly calculator. 
And on the calculator, it shows all of the different ingredients that you just started and what those cost over the course of a month, if you run them 24-7 for an entire month. So each of these two templates, it has its own set of resources, right? The first template uh, constructs, you know, really uh, three machines. The second template constructs two machines. You know, those instances are variable. You could create them at different sizes. So following the defaults, um, you know, that template isn't particularly expensive for the, for the structure that it deploys. I don't have the raw dollar amount in front of me, but, um, but, it, but it is the kind of thing where you're talking about more than hundreds of dollars a month. So you certainly want to run the templates, do your testing, and, and make sure that you learn what you need to learn from the system. Um, or get busy deploying production infrastructure there because it's, it most certainly does not fit inside of our free tier. Okay, thank you. Um, so how about spot instances? Can, that, can we factor spot instance requests into a CloudFormation template? So, so spot instances is an interesting one. You can create spot instance requests with CloudFormation, but using spot instances with with this kind of workload is a, is a little bit odd. So, um, you know, most certainly the, you know, about the only thing you can guarantee about a spot instance is that at some point it will turn off. And, and so in a design where you have this extra structure that allows you to tolerate those kinds of failures, certainly it can make some sense that, you know, maybe part of my redundancy is running in a spot environment. The only real downside to that is that there isn't anything in the CloudFormation template design that will, that will change the behavior of the system once that replication has been undermined, once a spot instance has been taken away because, of a, because we exceeded the, the price that you bid in the template. So it, it also needs to include the kind of alarming and triggering, which you can configure at the Windows tier or at the AWS tier, to ensure that someone on your side is coming back in to restore redundancy. Uh, the whole point of deploying in this kind of always-on model uh, is, to, is to deliver that high availability. And so um, most certainly you would not want to have both of the Windows Server failover cluster instances be the same spot instance bid or even have them both be spot instances at all. At a minimum, one of those instances should be the one you don't want to turn off. And you'd want to be particularly careful if there is a large-scale event of some kind where, for example, an availability zone fails. If the availability zone where your on-demand instance goes away and so you're only running on spot, you need to be very careful about the setup of that system because spot instances can be taken away at any time. It really kind of goes against the grain of even high availability in theory, right? Well, Maybe if you're going to do that, it'd be a third failover or something like that. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the Having it there is more available than not having it, but, but it certainly challenges all of the basic mathematics of what high availability means, and so you're going to want to study that problem. I, I can see advanced users um, you know, finding a way to add that again, like as the third replica or the fourth replica, or using them as reporting servers is maybe a great way to look at it. or. Um, you know, differently indexed databases for certain short t running types of queries, but certainly not a basic best practice for your run of the mill setup. Great. And um, can you speak to robustness here? It's maybe a hard thing to measure, but maybe relative to other solutions in the in the marketplace or sure. There's there's a couple places where AWS has built. Uh, built our services in a way that I think add a lot of value around uh, around a robust, around a very healthy, very highly available service. So I think the biggest component there just is the availability zone availability zone design all by itself. So it's really normal to set up this kind of always on high availability cluster inside the same rack in people's data centers, and that just provides none of the protections. Uh, around power and cooling and facilities consistency and floods and earthquakes and lightning bolts and acts of God and all sorts of weird stuff. So being in two totally physically separated, isolated, designed to fail independently kinds of buildings is a giant boon. 
And that's a built-in default, no extra cost, completely easy to use because of these templates feature of AWS that could be by itself so complicated to implement in your own data centers that, that you just don't even consider it. Um, another component there is that, like for example, if you fail a Windows failover cluster because a part of the computer that you run melted down, in a normal environment, you may have to wait for replacement parts. In AWS, there is no replacement parts. You just create another instance, and we have lots of them. So that makes it so that your recovery time is much, much more predictable, much more consistent, not subject to external forces in large. So a uh, very, uh, very powerful way to make sure that the highly available design is highly available in practice. All right. And with that, this concludes today's webinar session. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, I'm going to hang on the uh, interface here to answer a few of the last remaining questions, um, but everybody else, if you still need something answered, feel free to use the Contact Us um, forms that we gave at the end of the deck. Um, have a good day, everybody. And I'd also like to remind you just to take a second to please fill out that survey. Let us know what you thought of today's webcast, and thank you so much. <laughs>